Hello and welcome to another TLDR news video on the only topic anyone's talking about at the moment, coronavirus. This one's going to be specifically about the UK government's response to the coronavirus. You might have noticed that the UK has been pretty relaxed in response to the virus, or at least it was when this video was written. Schools are still open and the government's main bit of advice seems to be wash your hands. So in this video, we're going to explain why. As we've said before on this channel, all of our coronavirus content has been demonetized, which means we've lost a significant amount of revenue and our videos have been suppressed in the algorithm. If you want to help us out with the money issue and support our team, there's links to our Patreon, stores and PayPal down below. If you want to help get our videos seen, even though the algorithm isn't picking up on them, please share, like and comment on this video. Thank you so much for your support. So, why has the UK government seemed so relaxed about the coronavirus thus far? Well, after coming under some pressure, the government's chief scientific officer, Sir Patrick Vallance, went on BBC Radio 4's Today programme to explain the government's position. Dr David Halpern, the leader of the government's behavioural insights team, otherwise known as the Nudge Unit, said a similar thing. Both of them mentioned herd immunity. So, what is that? Well, basically, Herd immunity is when enough members of a population are immune to a disease such that each ill person infects at most one other ill person on average. In medical terms, when R0 is less than 1. This means that the number of people infected can't grow exponentially, as has been happening with the coronavirus, which currently has R0 of somewhere between 2 and 3, meaning that each sick person infects on average somewhere between 2 and 3 more people. Obviously, if most of the population is immune to the virus, then R0 goes down. For coronavirus, it's estimated that about 60% of the population would have to be immune for herd immunity to kick in. Basically, imagine you're sick with coronavirus. On average, according to R0, you cough on, let's say, two and a half people over the course of your illness. At the moment, given that only a tiny fraction of the population is immune to coronavirus, that means you're going to cause about 2.5 more cases of the virus. However, if 60% of the population is immune, then R0 is only going to be 40% of the 2.5 people you infect, or 1. This means that on average, you're only going to pass the disease onto one person. So the number of corona cases should remain stable and then eventually drop. There are basically two ways of responding to an epidemic like coronavirus. Either you go for this herd immunity or you go for containment. Containment essentially means shutting everything down to limit the amount of interpersonal contact, artificially suppressing R0. While these containment measures are in place, R0 falls near zero, so the recovery rate is greater than the rate of infection. This means that the total number of cases falls. However, this is only a temporary solution. Once you relax the containment measures by reopening schools and sports events, all it takes is one infected person to start the whole thing off again. And then you have to go into lockdown all over again. Ideally, the disease will be completely eradicated after some time in containment. But this is unlikely for coronavirus, given the number of cases and the fact that some people are asymptomatic. The advantage of containment is that it gives you more time to develop a treatment or vaccine, or at very least, to manufacture some more care units in anticipation of the next wave, once you relax the containment measures. This is the policy that the World Health Organization and almost every infected country in the world have taken up, apart from the UK that is. The UK has chosen to go for the herd immunity tactic. Their plan is to essentially allow 60% of the population to get infected as fast as possible to quickly achieve the herd immunity they want. Ideally, this 60% would be mainly young people with mild symptoms. According to Dr David Halpern, the idea is that the old and vulnerable people cocoon while the rest of the population develops herd immunity. According to the government, the UK needs to develop herd immunity to avoid a second spike in winter, when the NHS is already close to breaking point. This is the best policy in economic terms, because you don't have to shut anything down, which could result in totally crippling the economy. And because of the herd immunity, you only have one economic shock, albeit one that extends across a longer period of time than if you had chosen containment. The UK government has come under some criticism, notably from the World Health Organization, mainly because herd immunity is a high-risk strategy. 
it makes some pretty big assumptions, and it's not an easy sell politically, because it involves sacrificing lives in the short term in order to save lives in the long term. But we'll get onto that in a bit. Let's start with the assumptions. We think there are five assumptions, and the last two are pretty huge. First is that there'll be no vaccine developed soon. This seems pretty unlikely, given that most experts believe that it'll be at least a year until there's a vaccine available. But nonetheless, it's an assumption, so worth noting. Second is that the government seems to be relying on certain behavioural assumptions. They seem confident that older, vulnerable people will remain cocooned until the herd immunity is achieved in the wider community. If this doesn't happen, and 60% of old people end up being affected, the NHS doesn't have the resources to care for those severe cases. The third is that the coronavirus cannot be recontracted. This is one of the points made by the World Health Organization in their criticism of the UK. It's not certain that once you've been infected, you maintain immunity. In fact, although rare, there have been reported cases of reinfection in Japan. It's possible that these people never actually recovered, and it was just a false negative test between two positives. But if it does turn out that immunity doesn't last, or if coronavirus mutates seasonally, then the herd immunity isn't going to help anything. The UK will just have let 40 million people get infected for no good reason. The fourth assumption is that the government seems confident that it can control the rate of infection to prevent the NHS from becoming overwhelmed. The idea is to keep the infection rate as close to the recovery rate as possible, meaning that as patients leave hospital, the same number of new cases are admitted. This keeps the total number in care constant at any time, but for this to happen, the government has to successfully control the rate of infection, and it's unclear how they plan to do this. Coronavirus, like all other viruses, has an exponential rate of infection, and there's a great 3 blue one brown video on the maths behind it if you want to know more. Given that the symptoms appear 2 to 3 days after infection, the government must have some pretty phenomenal models to be confident in the infection rate. You're trying to predict exponential growth with a minimum delay of 2 days. Then you need to figure out what sort of impact policies like closing schools or encouraging social distancing will have on the rate. This is risky, because if the government's model is wrong and the rate of infection spirals out of control, the NHS won't be able to care for all the ill people. And on that note, what's the appropriate rate of infection? Well, we can actually do the maths here ourselves, and it's pretty basic. Assuming that we need 40 million people infected for the herd immunity, according to the latest data from South Korea, which we're taking as the most reliable because they've done the most per capita testing, about 1% of cases end up being severe. That means that there'll be a total of about 400,000 severe cases. Assuming that each severe case lasts about a week in an intensive care unit or ICU, which by the way is a conservative estimate, that means a cumulative time of 400,000 weeks of ICU. The NHS has about 5,000 ICU beds, which is about 6 per 100,000 people. To put that in context, Italy has twice as many per capita, and Germany has five times as many, according to the OECD. Currently, there are only about 1,000 spare beds, but let's just assume they free up. That means that assuming a constant rate of infections, if every severe patient is treated in an ICU, it would take 80 weeks, or about 18 months, for 40 million people to be infected. And that's with generous assumptions about the ICU time per patient and the availability of ICUs. So it would seem, if the government wants the population to reach the 60% herd immunity threshold before winter, it will have to exceed the current ICU limits, unless it can find some new ones. Which brings us on nicely to our fifth assumption, that the government can weather the political storm. This herd immunity policy, in essence, sacrificed people's lives now in order to try and save lives later. The key word there being try, because as we've just mentioned, there are a lot of ways this could fail. This is, for obvious reasons, a difficult thing to sell politically. If the government commits this policy, the UK death toll will continue to rise while it begins to slow down in other countries, which commit to containment measures. While they might believe it's the right decision in the long term, it will be hard to convince the public that letting 40 million people get infected is a good idea, when South Korea looks like it can keep the infection down to 10,000 cases using containment measures. And when literally the rest of the world is going for containment instead of herd immunity, 
it looks like a case of unnecessary, self-inflicted harm. And the only thing the government can say is don't worry about the 40 million infected people in six months' time, you'll see. Which leads us to our worst case scenario. The government bows to political pressure and tries to move to containment, but does so too late. In this case, a large percentage of the population will be infected, but likely less than the 60% required for herd immunity to kick in. So those are the assumptions behind the government's response. While it might seem a bit risky, it's worth noting that containment isn't the ideal policy either. For countries like Italy and China, which have gone into full lockdown, there doesn't seem to be a long-term plan. How can you relax the lockdown without going straight back into another epidemic? Well, so while the UK is currently doing things differently, neither policy is a perfect solution. This is a pandemic after all. It should be relatively unsurprising that there's no easy way out. As a last note, that bit of maths about the ICUs was a basic back of napkin calculation. If anyone who knows more about the specifics could tell us why our maths might be wrong, and can explain how the UK can reach herd immunity in six months with current ICU capacity, please do let us know in the comments. And as a last note, some commentators have accused this policy of being cruel, because it involves essentially sacrificing human lives. In the government's defence, lots of policies implicitly have a trade-off between human life and some other good. The only difference here is that the trade-off is more explicit. If anything, this current policy is a trade-off between human life now and more human life later, which, assuming there's no morally relevant difference between a life now versus a death later, should be a fairly easy calculation to make. The policy might not work though, and it seemingly relies on some far-fetched assumptions. But if you take issue with it merely because it weighs human life, you've got to take issue with loads of other policies, even including things like speed limits if you want to be consistent. Oh, and one last, last thing. After we've finished writing this script, the government tried to distance themselves from the phrase herd immunity. The health secretary, Matt Hancock, wrote a piece for The Telegraph on Sunday, claiming that we have a plan based on the expertise of world-leading scientists. Herd immunity is not part of it. And a spokesman for his department said herd immunity is not part of our action plan, but is a natural byproduct of an epidemic. So maybe they're already U-turning. Or maybe they're just distancing themselves from the seemingly toxic phrase, herd immunity. Stay tuned to TLDR to find out what the government's plan actually is when they finally decide to tell us in plain English. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date and hit the bell icon to be notified every time I release a video.